It's February 3rd, time for another weekly MRAP. Jan, so glad to be back. Always good to be with you, Swami. Happy February. Absolutely. You know, this is the 3rd of February. It's not the 1st. I had to look up and see if there were some interesting events that happened on the 3rd of February. I got two big ones. The first is a drug that gets me through my week. It's not ketamine. It's ibuprofen. (laughs) I don't think that I could exist as a 47-year-old man without large doses of ibuprofen on a regular basis. So ibuprofen invented in 1969. And the other one, Jan, maybe even a bigger thing, the creation of Pixar, February 3rd, 1986. Jan, do you have a favorite Pixar movie? Do I have a favorite Pixar movie? Is Toy Story a Pixar movie? Toy Story is a Pixar movie. Okay, that is my favorite Pixar movie. Oh, wait, that's is, a good find, one. is Finding Nemo a Pixar movie? Finding Nemo is a Pixar yes, movie. That's, I got two. That's, that's, that's it. Finding Nemo is your hit. All right. All right. I, I like that one. You know, I think if I, if I look back on it, the one that I've seen the most was probably Cars because my oldest was like a, a little tyke when that movie came out. I've watched it way too many times, but I really like The Incredibles. I like the idea of the family of superheroes. Like that's a, that is a great reason to make a movie. Absolutely. But from Finding Nemo, the, the phrase in Finding Nemo just keep swimming, just, just keep, keep swimming. swimming. I, that's like an ER mantra for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I love it. I love it. But that's not what we're here for, Jen. We have a case to get into. It's got a little bit of a family side to it. So uh, why don't you bring us in for this case? Yeah, this is a bit of an unusual case. And you're right. It does have a family side to it because this is a patient who's 27 years old and she is brought in by her mother. Her mother is the one who's pushing her in a wheelchair saying, this is my daughter, I need you to help her. And basically when I say what's wrong with her, the answer is she's just acting weird. Just She is just not herself. That's always a strange chief complaint because, you know, I don't know this person. What, what do you mean by that? So getting some more history, it's been going on for about two months. Mom says this is a daughter who's a bit estranged from her. She's been living outside of Los Angeles for a few months, and she just returned two days before. And this is not the same daughter that she knew before. This other city that she had been living in, what the mom knows is that she had been hospitalized about a month ago for also not being herself and was told that she had some kind of a stroke. That's what the mom says happened to her. But now that the daughter is there and she sees what's going on with her, she's like, this is not normal and somebody has to do more because this doesn't seem okay. She has no records. There's no imaging. And the patient can't tell us that much about what had been done. Now, I'll give you a little bit more before I ask you what you think, because that's not a lot to go on. But I'll tell you that she has really no medical history to speak of other than this recent workup for stroke, in quotation marks. She has no history, according to her mother, of drug or alcohol abuse. And in terms of what she means by acting weird and not herself, her mom says she's not remembering things. She's talking differently than she normally does. She's acting differently in her behavior. She's not sleeping right. Like, this is not the same person. And she'd also been complaining of some abdominal pain. That was another little layer to this as well. So knowing all of that, Swami, give me your first reaction to that that history and what I've told you so far. All right. You said it's not a lot to go on. Jan, that's like nothing to go on. I got nothing to work from. But, you know, these are these are difficult situations. We see this in the emergency department where people come in with these very vague kind of nonspecific things and we have to determine some kind of a pathway. So where do we start? Okay. Vital signs. I want the vital signs. I want a gross neuro exam. You know, it'd be great. The board answer is get a detailed, thorough neuro exam for this patient, but I'm not sure that you're going to get that if the patient's acting weird. So at least a gross neuro exam, what's moving, what's not moving. That's really going to be helpful. The way that the mom describes her acting weird, not herself makes me think about some form of encephalopathy. And within that, I kind of want to know a temporality. Is this something that has been coming and going over the last two days? Like there are periods where she's lucid and she's normal and then she lapses back. The mom says that there's no history of drug use or alcohol use. I never trust anybody. So we got to keep those things in there. And then there's also like weird herbal supplements that the patient could be taking or took in the past that could have some of these effects. And then the other thing that I'm I'm thinking about is this prior hospitalization. Was it a psychiatric hospitalization? Was it a medical hospitalization? Do they at least know the name of the hospital that the patient was at? Maybe I can get some more data. But right now, I think I'm going to start with vitals, gross neuro exam, and then trying to tease out the temporality. I think I had all of those same thoughts, 
specifically about what hospital she was at, because that you know, I agree with you like that. There probably were things done there that I wanted to know. And she was in a big city and they did not know the name of the hospital. So it was not going to be easy to, to narrow it down. So that was kind of off the table from what I could tell. Um, so her vitals were normal, including a temperature, a reliable temperature, totally normal. And in terms of exam, this is an area where I think, you know, we undervalue sometimes the part of the exam that is the general part of the exam, right? What does this person generally look like when you're dealing with her? Because you're right, we're not going to get a lot of specifics in terms of neuro exam, in terms of, you know, detailed neuro exam. So generally, this is a young woman sitting in a wheelchair who's kind of like writhing around a little bit, like sort of odd movements that I'm noticing. She has this very unusual speech. She'll talk to me intermittently has she has some attention deficit like sometimes she can sort of focus in on what I'm saying sometimes she's not really answering but when she's talking it's in this very juvenile kind of whiny voice you know um it was unusual she's speaking so she's not having any dysarthria or expressive aphasia but she is just speaking in this very odd strange way and she seems really irritable and unfocused. So when I answer her a question, she seems irritated that I'm asking her a question. Is your is your stomach hurting? Yes, my stomach's hurting. What do you want? You know, like very hard to talk to. Um, reminded me of like an adolescent talking to them who's in pain, who seems irritated and tired. She tells me that she was in another hospital. She can tell me that they told her she had a stroke, but she can't really tell me like, did they put you through a tube and do some imaging? She doesn't know. She can't remember. She can't focus. Um, the rest of her exam, like her skin and her perfusion, all of that looked okay. Kind of pushing around on her belly. It was sort of generally tender, not really focally tender from what I could tell, but it seemed like she definitely had some tenderness. That seemed to be objectively true. And there aren't any focal or lateralizing neuro findings that I can see. Mm. So, I mean, this writhing around makes me think about is this a dystonic reaction? Did she get some kind of an antipsychotic? And this is a, a fixed, um, <clears throat> there's a fixed dystonic reaction. Is it like a choreoapatoid movement that I got to think about something like that, but I'm not really matching that with the way she's speaking. Those things aren't really marrying in my brain. I think it's easy enough to kind of push down the psych pathway with this, but 27 is a little bit on the older side to have a first break. It's obviously not unheard of. It happens, but that's not where we're going to go. Clearly, if we're discussing the case, we're not going in that direction. And I think what we're kind of left with is she's got these weird movements that makes me think about brain. So I'm going to get some imaging of the brain. And then she's got this belly pain, which even though it's not focal and the examination isn't really specific, I'm probably going to image the belly just because I don't really have anywhere else to go. So top of my list is to get a non-con head CT, to get some kind of imaging of the abdomen, probably a CT abdomen pelvis. I'm sure we're going to get a bunch of blood tests that are unlikely to tell me anything, but we're going to get them anyway. Yeah, my first instincts were similar in terms of, is this just psych? Is this some mixture of drug use or drug withdrawal mixed in with some psych? Like maybe there's something odd here, but it was also these weird movements that seemed to me the thing that was, it wasn't a lateralizing neuro finding, but it definitely seemed out of the ordinary. So I agree, a pretty broad workup was initiated, including a CT head, CT abdomen, kind of generally looking I'll tell you that, you know, obviously you get a glucose right away. You have a, basically an altered mental status. It was normal. Um, a pregnancy test, also normal. And then general labs start coming back and overall pretty normal. She had a slightly elevated white blood cell count. Uh, nothing much to write home about. It was like 11,000, I think. The UA was negative. CT head comes back negative. I wasn't shocked because it wasn't mm. that focal, but it was negative. And so we decided to go after the abdominal pain next. We ordered that CT, as we mentioned, and we find something. Ooh. Does that clue you into anything? So there's nothing that's popping up in my head of like, oh, this is what you found. This is the diagnosis. The other thing I kind of want to add, you kind of cut to this CT showing something, but an LP is going to be pretty high up on my list. I mean, the patient doesn't have a fever, but acting weird. So I'm probably going to want a lumbar puncture. We've kind of talked in the past that if I spend more than like a minute or two trying to convince myself I don't need a lumbar puncture, in fact, I do need a lumbar puncture, so I would probably LP this girl too. But now that you found something on CT, maybe that's going to obviate the need for that LP. But nothing is really jumping into my head about abdominal pain, some finding on that CT, plus this weird neuro complaints kind of thing. I mean, aortic catastrophes we know can cause weird neuro symptoms 
and have belly pain, but this is a 27 year old girl. Her having an aortic dissection seems very unlikely unless you're hiding something else about the fact that she looks marfanoid or something like that. Endocrine stuff, endocrine stuff is weird. It can cause all kinds of strange things. So if we didn't, I probably am going to get like a TSH and stuff like that. But even that, I can't really put it together into how this is going to give me something on that abdomen CT. So, um, you got to tell me, what did you find on the abdomen CT? Okay. Uh, the CT showed an ovarian mass. Ovarian mass. Okay. So uh, ovarian mass, 27-year-old woman, neuro complaints, belly pain. I, 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 <laughs> like, there's something in like the back of my brain, Jan, that's screaming at me, but I can't quite pull it out. I can't quite extract that little bit of knowledge, but um, I still, I'm still not sure. I'm probably going to call the radiologist and be like, what does this ovarian mass look like to you? And maybe that's going to push me a little bit further. Mm, That's a good question. And I'm going to tell you, it looks like a teratoma. All right. Now uh, I I have like bells and alarms going off because we have talked about this before on MRAP. At some point we have talked about uh, these weird mental status type of complaints, these these weird neurologic complaints and teratomas. I got it. This is where I'm going to like, I'm going to go into a corner where the residents can't (laughs) see me. And I'm going to pull out my phone and I'm going to Google a couple of things together, or I'm going to go to MRAP and I'm going to search a couple of terms together. And I know I'm going to get a hit, but I'm not pulling it up right now. So, uh, all right, just, you got to give it to me, Jen. What are we talking about here? Okay. So I'm right there with you. Something triggered in me when I saw the teratoma, like, I know this, I know this neuro teratoma combination from somewhere. And it's not because I'm a genius because I have a good memory and you and I live in MRAP land. And I knew I had heard about this before. And so it is an anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis. Do you remember oh, that? Oh, I remember this now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. All right. I, I definitely would not have come up with it on my own, though. I would have definitely had to use the app to find it. Yeah. So we did two segments on this back in 2014. So a long time ago, we first talked about it. And then in 2020, Saul and Eileen did a piece on a, on a PEDS patient that had this, that Saul had seen. And I remembered that piece. I remembered that there was this association between ovarian masses in particular and an encephalitis. Um, And I went back and listened to that piece. And there were some really good pearls in it about what's going on here. Um, But if it's okay with you, can I just run through a mnemonic? Yeah, absolutely. Please. All right. So as a review, this mnemonic came up in Saul's piece, and I thought it was really helpful, which is basically the NMDAR for receptor. And the N was for nonspecific prodromal period, which really could be anything. That one's not that helpful because it could be a fever. It could be GI symptoms. It could be anything. And often patients don't remember what it was. But the M is for memory and cognition impairment, which this patient definitely had. The D is for dystonia and dyskinesias, which is exactly what this patient had. The A is for autonomic dysfunction, which happens later in the course, but they can get blood pressure variations, heart rate variations. They can get bradycardias, in fact. And the R is for respiratory depression, which is another interesting one. And what was also fascinating was that this can happen all the way from children, young children, really any age this has been described. So it's pretty fascinating. This is really, really interesting. And I remember a little bits and pieces. So that LP that we talked about, we still want it. There's still going to be some things that we look for, but... Actually, now that we have a a presumptive diagnosis or a preliminary diagnosis, that's going to change some of the tests that we get with that LP. Now, usually when we do an LP, we save like an extra tube because we're like, someone's going to want some other tests that we didn't think about. But I know that there is an NMDA receptor test. And I think you want to get that on your cerebral spinal fluid. So I still want to get that LP. I still want to get that information. And then I guess I'm going to call GYN and neuro and medicine, and uh, you got any other consultants in the hospital? Because I think I'm going to call them too. Yeah. You know, actually, just for a second, I'll talk about the LP timing, because I think that is of interest to most people listening, which is, this is not obviously an infectious encephalopathy or encephalitis. So do you need to do the LP in the emergency department? Because the timing of it probably isn't crucial. It is not a time-dependent diagnosis at this point. So honestly, for those of you listening, thinking I wouldn't have done an LP, I would have just admitted this patient. I am right there with you. And I did not either. I admitted the patient. They'd already been there a long, long time. And I didn't think that LP timing was crucial. I knew did she need one. She needed one. But the timing of the therapy, the timing of the you know diagnostic test is not crucial. So, um, you know, if you work in a busy place where you're not necessarily going to do this, it might be a, a test that you defer. Now, you may work somewhere where this would be a test that you would do. So I just want to leave that open for consideration that we're not suggesting that this has to be done in the emergency department because it is not a time sensitive test in this case. Would you agree? 
Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, you know, my problem is I've got a ton of residents running around and we don't do a lot of LPs. So most of them want an LP because they need to add it to their list of things to do. So I probably would have gotten it in the emergency department. And when I say I would have gotten it, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I would have asked a resident to go and do it. Exactly. But I agree with you hundred percent. If I was working like a busy community shift on like a Friday evening at five o'clock, this is not on my list of things I have to get done right away. Absolutely. Agree. Um, so what do you do for this condition? So she ended up getting admitted. She had her teratoma removed. It was huge. She also got steroids and IVIG because this is an autoimmune process, an anti-NMDA receptor process. So we got to knock down that immune system. She was in the hospital for another eight days. She had some post-op ilia. She was probably there a little longer than was needed. But basically, by the time she was discharged, she was mostly back to her baseline, according to what her mom was saying and what the patient was saying, which is pretty amazing that knocking down the immune system, getting those those anti-receptors, you know, um, lower made a big difference in her neurostatus. And she was discharged like pretty much normal. What an amazing, uh, these are just amazing presentations. These really totally nonspecific things. And within a couple of hours, you can actually have some kind of a presumptive diagnosis. And Jane, you know, you said you're not a genius. We all know that's not true. To just lock this into your memory and be able to pull it back out is incredible. Now, not only that, but you went to Corpendium, you looked in the app and you said, you know what? We don't actually have a chapter on this and people are going to run into this problem and not know what to do. So we're putting that together. That should be out around the time that we release this segment. But if not, it's going to be there soon afterwards. People can go back and check out that 2020 piece from Saul and Eileen. That's going to give you a lot of the ins and outs here. But here's kind of what I store. I'm going to try to store for the next time this comes up, Jan. If you have a patient who has some weird neuro symptoms and they have a weird affect, they have this encephalopathy, there's no infectious symptoms, NMDA receptor encephalitis Anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis has to be a consideration, and, and you're not going to find it very often. This might be a once-in-a-lifetime kind of thing, but just put it on the list and consider it. I think when I look at this, I, I probably would have gotten that head CT and the abdomen CT. I'm not sure if I would have made the leap to the exact diagnosis, but if we can at least put it in the chart, then when we admit the patient, somebody else can help to continue that process and chase it down. Absolutely. A lot of the momentum that we start in the emergency department always matters. So even the suggestion gets things started faster. It gets people, other people thinking about it, looking it up and and trying, you know, the therapies because there really isn't a lot of other things that that match this diagnosis. Part of the thing that's I think key to this is some kind of new behavioral or motor change without much in the way of history. And this is not an infectious process and it's not psych. Like you basically kind of go down the list as we did and you end up with this is something weird. I know it's real. What could this be? And this is an autoimmune mediated thing. So as you go through your systems, that's always, you know, kind of on the list. Is it rheumatologic? Is it autoimmune? Is it, you know, oncology? Like, is this where the fever is coming from? One of those more unusual sources. This kind of falls into that category for me. So it's certainly an unusual diagnosis, but it's something that you can identify and get them started down the right path. And if you make this diagnosis in the emergency department, you're a legend. You're an absolute legend. People are going to remember this forever. Oh, yeah, that that doctor right there. She's the one who made the anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis diagnosis last week. No one's ever going to forget that because these are hard diagnoses to make. But now that we've talked about it, I bet you, I bet you, Jen, we're going to get listener emails written in over the next couple of months about people picking this diagnosis up. Well, I, you know, to MRAT's credit, this is why sometimes we talk about unusual things. We plant these seeds. And if you listen and you remember, you know, you will remember these little things that come up every once in a while and it can help you. And that's how it helped me. So, you know, yeah. All right. What a fantastic case, Jan. I love this. Um, we have some non-anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis segments up over this week. Uh, we don't, we're not going to talk about that diagnosis much more, but we have some really great stuff to get into. I'm super excited to share these segments with the listeners. Our first segment is going to be the critical care mailbag. It's going to be the hodgepodge with Weingart. And Jan, I'll see you on the other side of that segment. 